when you think about it, all of our energy comes from the sun. Wind and the weather it brings is all caused by the heating and cooling of the air that's warmed by the sun. The tides are caused by the moon mostly, but in a smaller part by the gravitation from the sun. Geothermal heat was created during the formation of the Earth and the Sun and the entire solar system, and fossil fuels are basically just sequestered solar energy that was gathered by photosynthetic algae millions of years ago. So here's an idea. Why don't we just cut out the middleman? Today I'm wrapping up my three-part series on renewable energy with wind and solar. Enjoy. Renewable energy really shouldn't be a political issue, but somehow it became one, and there's two particular types of energy that tend to split a crowd the most, so I saved those for last. First is wind energy. Legendary oil man T. Boone Pickens called the United States the Saudi Arabia of wind. And when you look at maps like this, it's easy to see why. As the Earth rotates toward the west, it slides underneath the atmosphere, which from our perspective gives it a general eastward direction. That eastward wind sweeps over the Rocky Mountains and then rushes down across the plains, creating one of the largest wind corridors in the world. And in the last 10 years, investments in commercial wind have boomed in the United States. Economies of scale have started to kick in and the price of wind turbines have gone down. It also costs little to maintain and operate and help create energy independence in smaller communities. And it creates a revenue source for local ranchers who lease out their land to the energy companies. And they're more space efficient. On the ground they actually take up very little space, which means that those ranchers that lease out that land can still use that land for agriculture. Plus it's a huge growth sector for jobs, currently employing over 100,000 people, and it's expected to employ over 600,000 people in the next 30 years. All good things. Wait for it. While the price is going down, they are still expensive and inefficient. And they work best in remote areas that require a lot of infrastructure to get that power into the cities where it's needed the most. The noises they make tend to bother some people and reportedly they kill around 400,000 birds and bats annually. Now in fairness it should be noted that over 900 million birds die every year by flying into buildings. Is it just me or does that sound like a lot of birds? But the biggest problem is that they're wildly intermittent. Tidal energy for example is intermittent but predictable. Wind is totally unpredictable. Whole days can pass with no energy coming out of these things. So without a robust energy storage solution in place, wind is always going to be supplemental. And the worldwide energy potential for wind energy is 400 terawatts, which is impressive, but still supplemental. Now there are some ideas in place to use kites and inflatable turbines to get energy from the jet stream that's way up high in the atmosphere. That may generate a lot more energy, but right now those are just in the experimental phase. So right now, wind energy is a mixed bag. Economically it does really great things, but it's still a ways to go and some technology needs to be developed in order to make it any, anywhere near a base load energy solution. Now, all of that brings us to our final energy source, solar energy. Now there's a reason why I saved solar for last, because there's something different about solar, something different from all types of energy, clean and dirty. Photovoltaic solar cells, or PV cells, have no moving parts. All the other sources of energy create electricity by turning a turbine, either through using steam or heat or water or wind, but solar literally just collects the energy coming out of the sky. When asked if he was interested in fusion power as a source of energy, Elon Musk famously said that we have a giant fusion reactor in the sky just raining energy down on us every day. All we have to do is collect it. Now there are some negatives to solar power, let's just get that out of the way. The first and most obvious one is there's no sun at night. So this is definitely an intermittent power source. But it's intermittent more like tidal energy than like wind energy because the sun is gonna come up every day. If it doesn't, we got bigger problems. And yeah, even in cloudy weather, it's still producing something. They also take up a lot of land. Unlike the wind farm that we were talking about earlier, if a rancher wanted to lease out his land to put up solar cells, there's nothing else he'd be able to do with that land. But you can use currently existing infrastructure like buildings and transport corridors. Now the big hangups for most people come in the construction of the solar panels because they do have some environmentally hazardous materials involved and some rare earth elements that need to be disposed of properly. And some PV panels require rare earth elements like those found in cadmium telluride or copper iridium gallium selenide, which is all the more reason to recycle the panels properly. Luckily, 96% of a solar panel can be recycled. Unfortunately, the recycling infrastructure is pretty small right now, but it's expected to blow up quite a bit in the next 30 years. But the one that gets the solar haters the most twisted up is the fact that it does produce greenhouse gases to make solar panels, specifically nitrogen trifluoride and sulfur hexafluoride. And yes, that sucks. But the argument that we should stick with coal over solar because of those greenhouse gas emissions is frankly absurd. Because with solar panels it's a one-shot deal and then you're getting clean free energy for the next 20 to 30 years. With coal you're constantly pumping out greenhouse gases that entire time. It can't even be compared. 
This debate was laid to rest by Wilfred van Sark of Utrecht University in the Netherlands. In a paper for the trade Nature Communications, he and his team calculated the amount of greenhouse gas emissions created by PV panel production all the way back to 1975 to see how long it would take before they made back their debt. They adjusted for the different processes used over time and for the different conditions that those panels were made in in different places around the world. What they found was that solar panels created back in 1975 created 300 to 400 grams of greenhouse gases, whereas solar panels created today only put out 20 grams of greenhouse gases. So panels made back in 1975 would take 20 years to make back their carbon debt. Today, it's only two years. That's both because they're producing a lot fewer emissions when they make them, but also because they're far more efficient. Overall, the clean energy output of solar panels will exceed the carbon debt of all solar panels ever made in 2018. Meaning after next year, solar panels will be a net negative source of carbon until the end of time. Boom. Now, whenever I've been able to find the information, I've shared what the worldwide potential for these energy resources are so that we can compare them against the worldwide energy consumption. And for the most part, they've been underwhelming. Whelming at best. But the total global worldwide potential for solar is mind-blowing. This is where solar really shines. <laughs> the amount of sunlight that reaches the Earth's surface every day is over 3 million terawatt hours. That's 142 times our global energy expenditure for the entire year. Now, of course, we can't cover the entire planet with solar panels, and we don't need to collect nearly that much electricity, so what can we actually do with this information? Well, let's math the shit out of this. All right, according to Wikipedia, 3,850,000 exajoules of energy reach the surface from the sun every year. That converts to 1,069,444,444 terawatt hours. Now, only 21% of the Earth's surface is land, so that comes out to 224,583,333 terawatt hours hitting the land. And according to the World Bank World Development Report, humans inhabit about 10% of the Earth's land, so that comes down to 22,485,333 terawatt hours a year. If we put solar panels on just 1% of that already inhabited and developed land, those panels would capture 224,583 terawatt hours per year. If you factor in an average efficiency of 15% for solar panels, which is getting better every year, by the way, we're generating 33,687 terawatt hours per year, 59% more than global electricity consumption. That's 1%. This is not impossible. Solar has its drawbacks, but it's easily the most scalable of our renewable energy resources. Not every place in the world has a river you can dam, or tides that you can use, or a crack in the earth that you can manipulate, or a lot of wind for that matter. But the sun shines everywhere. True, it shines more in some places than others, but it shines everywhere. But to me, the best thing about solar is it's something that you can do. You can't build a dam, you can't harness tides, you can't build a biomass plant, but you can put solar panels on your roof. And you can make money by selling that energy back into the electricity grid. Can't afford to buy them? There are leasing options where you can just pay the installation company out of the money that you're making by selling that energy until it's paid off. Live in an apartment? You can form what they call community solar gardens, where the other people in the apartment complex all pool their money together to put up a solar installation, and then you all split the profits from that. There are so many things in this world that we have no control over, and it leads to this sort of defeatist complacency. But this is something you can actually do. Now, because of the intermittency, solar is something that is just not going to be a base load power solution unless you have some kind of massive energy storage infrastructure. This is why Elon Musk created the Tesla Powerwall and the commercial power pack solution. It's the first step to a solar-based decentralized energy grid backed up by baseload carriers like hydroelectric and biomass and when necessary, fossil fuels. I didn't even mention the other type of solar energy, which is concentrated solar thermal plants. These are the ones that use hundreds of mirrors to heat up a steam furnace. And some people prefer this over PV because it doesn't have those rare earth elements and hazardous materials that PV does. CST plants have another little trick up their sleeve, which is they store that energy in molten salt so it can continue to make energy throughout the night when the sun isn't shining. But they aren't as efficient as PVs and haven't been as economically profitable as we hope they'd be in the beginning. Now, what's really amazing is as much energy that hits the surface of the Earth every day, a whole bunch of it never even reaches the surface of the Earth. It gets reflected off in the atmosphere. So the Japanese space agency, JAXA, is working on a space-based solar power system. It would capture unfiltered solar power directly from the sun and then beam that down to a station on the ground through microwave radiation. So there's that. The energy grid of the future is going to be more decentralized and more diverse, which is a good thing. It's never good to have all your eggs in one basket. It's going to take a combination of all these things, wind, solar, biomass, hydro, tidal energy, to get us where we need to be. But it's the combination of all those things 
that can direct us towards a cleaner future. So I set out at the beginning of this series to be as objective as I possibly could. And honestly, my opinions did change a little bit. Now, for one thing, as many problems as we have with coal, I understand now why it works so well and why it's such a hard energy source to beat. I became a lot more disillusioned with geothermal and wind, but I was pleasantly surprised by biomass. I was already on board with solar, so that didn't change. But hopefully this gives a clear picture of the challenges with renewable energy, the places we need to work on, the places that are doing really well, what works, what doesn't work, and at least give you a little something to think about. Or you may disagree with me completely, which is always an option, and you can do that down below. And if you haven't seen the first two videos in this series, I'd definitely encourage you to do that. I will put up a link right here on the end screen. All right, now if this is your first time on this channel, first, go watch those other videos and watch some of my other videos because if you like this type of topic, I do stuff like this all the time. So subscribe and see new videos just like this every Monday. Special thanks to The Answer Files who help support this channel on Patreon. If you would like to join them and get special access to a secret vlog amongst all kinds of other behind the scenes goodies, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. And as always, this video is brought to you by Canker Boy. If you get canker sores or mouth ulcers on a regular basis, this is a daily supplement that helps prevent them from happening. You can get a risk-free two-month trial at cankerboy.com. All right, thanks again for watching. Like and share if you liked it. Now you guys go out there and have an eye-opening week, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.